This morning, I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me. I want you to turn to two different passages. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll start there. But we're going to be spending most of our time this morning in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 27 and 28. And so if you'll sort of put your thumb in Matthew chapters 27 and 28, and we'll start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 in just a a moment. As you're finding your way to that passage of Scripture, I want to tell you about something that happened. This is a true story that happened at a Christian school right at the beginning of the school year in a kindergarten class. The kindergarten teacher was welcoming a new group of students, and she knew uh, that kids who came to their school, though it was a Christian school, came from all kinds of backgrounds, and some of them were in church, and some of them weren't, and some of them knew Bible stories, and some of them didn't. And so she was just sort of trying to establish a baseline to find out how many Bible stories or how much of the Bible uh, the kids in her kindergarten class class knew. So she would meet with each one of them individually and just sort of check to see where they were. She usually started by talking to them about the story of Jesus. And so she was meeting with this one little boy. He didn't come from a church family, didn't come from a church background. And so everything about the Bible was brand new to him. And she was telling him the story of Jesus. And she said, Jesus died on the cross. And he stopped her and said, what is a cross? She went over to the craft box and got two popsicle sticks and formed a cross and told him a little bit about what the cross was and how Jesus was nailed there with his hands and his feet and how he for six hours died on the cross. And when the little boy heard that, he sort of hung his head and he said, well, that's too bad. And then really quickly, she told him that Jesus was in the tomb for three days, and then on the third day, he came back to life. He rose again, and he gives eternal life to everyone who trusts in him. And that little boy's eyes got as big as saucers, and he said, that is awesome. Now, here's the truth. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, where you stand with Jesus Christ, depends on how you respond to his story. If you respond to the story of Jesus and say, well, that's too bad, then you don't have a relationship with him. But if you know him and the power of his resurrection, then when you hear his story, you will say, that is awesome. I'm so thankful to God that he sent his son Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the grave to give us eternal life. And today I want to talk to you about how God brings light to our hearts through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to stand with me as we read God's word together. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read together verse 6. And there the Bible just talks about the light that God brings to our hearts through Jesus. Verse 6, the word of God says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now just look at that verse again. The same God who said, let there be light and created light and created everything that there is, including you. That same God has given us the light of his glory through his risen son, Jesus Christ. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, how we love you and praise you. We thank you for this good day that you've given us. We thank you that Jesus is alive and that changes everything. Lord, today speak to our hearts in the deepest parts of who we are. Lord, I pray for those in this room today who just need to be reminded of the light of Jesus in their lives. And then, Father, I pray for those in this room who have never trusted Jesus as Savior. God, I pray that today would be their day. I pray that today would be the day that they say yes to Jesus and that you would turn on the light of eternal life in their hearts and their lives, that they would say yes and be saved. 
We'll give you the glory and honor, Lord, for all that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Now, if you will, take your Bibles and turn with me back to the Gospel of Matthew at the beginning of the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at the last two chapters, chapters 27 and 28. And today, as we think about how God has shown the light of, of Christ on our lives through his resurrection, I want to talk to you about three truths about the light of Jesus revealed in the story of the empty tomb, revealed in the story of the resurrection. Three truths about the light of Jesus. First of all, the light of Jesus is a light that was shrouded by his tomb. And we start there. We start in darkness because that's where this story starts. His light was shrouded by his tomb. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 57. The Bible describes what happened at the end of the day when Jesus died. When it was evening, the Bible says, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Jesus had died. After six hours suffering on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he died. And the Bible says that a man from Arimathea, Arimathea was a little town in the hill country about 20 miles away from Jerusalem. This man's name was Joseph. Joseph was a Jewish leader. He was a part of the group called the Sanhedrin who had condemned Jesus. But Joseph had never consented to that decision. In fact, for some time, he had been a secret follower of Jesus Christ. And now he came to Pilate, the Roman governor, and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, most of the time when the Romans crucified someone after they died, they just left the body on the cross to decay. But Jesus died and Joseph came and took the body down. And the Bible says he laid that body in his own new tomb. There in the side of a rocky mountain, he had had a tomb made. It was a rectangular room with a small rectangular door and there was a round flat stone that they used to seal the tomb to keep away grave robbers or mainly wild animals. The Bible says that Joseph took the body of Jesus, the dead corpse of the Lord Jesus Christ and wrapped him up in a shroud, in a linen cloth. He used spices and other perfumes to begin to, to take care of the body for burial. And as he was doing his work, the Bible says, verse 61, Mary Magdalene and another woman named Mary were there. The Romans prohibited anyone who was crucified from being mourned. They couldn't grieve over him. They couldn't weep over him. They could just sit there and watch. I want you to imagine that you were sitting there next to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And you were watching in that dark, dark time. You know, some of the darkest times we experience are when we come out of bright daylight into a dark room. Maybe you've been outside and you come into a theater and when you come in, at first you can't see anything. It takes a while for your eyes to adjust just to be able to find your seat. You know what it's like. When you come out of daylight into darkness, it's really dark in those moments. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and you, if you were sitting there, had been in the presence of Jesus for maybe three years. And they had heard him teach about the kingdom of God and they had seen him work miracles and they knew that he was the Messiah and now he's dead. He's not breathing. 
His hand can't reach out to touch and to heal. His body is lifeless and still they've gone from bright daylight glory into complete darkness. Think about what you might have been feeling if you were sitting there with those women. Maybe you're feeling fear. After all, they've crucified Jesus and soon they'll be coming after his followers and you're one of his followers. Or maybe you even feel anger, not only anger at Pilate and and the Sanhedrin and, and other people, you may feel some anger toward Jesus. After all, he was so insistent to take every step all the way to the cross. And now he's dead. It was a dark time. The Bible says in verse one of chapter 28, Three days later, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And as they were on their way out to the tomb that day, they brought nothing with them other than the spices that they were going to use to anoint his body. They didn't bring any hope with them. They didn't bring any light with them. They didn't bring any joy with them. They didn't bring any peace with him. All of that was buried in the tomb. But I want to remind you of something. That light that was shrouded in the tomb was only shrouded temporarily. Let me say that one more time. That light buried in the tomb was only shrouded temporarily. Amen. Because Jesus Christ had come out of that tomb and nothing could stop the brilliance of his light. The Bible says in John's gospel, chapter one, verses four and five, in him, in Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Nothing can overcome the light of Jesus, not the grave, not anything else. Maybe you're here today and you've gone through repeated failures in your life. And it's caused the light and the hope to be dimmed in your life. But nothing can put out the light of Jesus in your life. Trauma and depression can't put out that light. Health issues cannot put out that light. Financial difficulties cannot put out that light. Family stress cannot put out that light. And and may I say today, immorality celebrated in the public square does not put out that light. I want to take just a moment. We love everyone. This church, we love everyone. We want everyone to know the power of Jesus to save and to deliver from sin. For over 2,000 years, This Sunday has been marked by believers to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And Friday's presidential proclamation declaring today, Easter Sunday, a day to celebrate trans visibility, dishonors Christ and Christians. But it also underscores that we live in a world of intense spiritual and moral darkness and that that darkness permeates even to the highest places. That darkness cannot and will not overcome the light of Jesus. His light was shrouded by the tomb. But then secondly, as we think about the light of Jesus, the Bible says his light is a light shining in his resurrection. It's a light shining in his resurrection. Now look in verses two through 10 of Matthew chapter 28. And in those verses, one word that really summarizes all of these verses for me is the word change. We just see change over and over in these verses. We see change from a sealed tomb to an open tomb. Look in verse two. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. The tomb that had been sealed was now open. And by the way, it was not open so that Jesus could get out. He passed right through that tomb. It was open so that the disciples could get in and see that Jesus was not there, for he was risen. We see a change from a sealed tomb to an open tomb. We also see a change from darkness to light. Notice how the Bible describes the angel, verse three. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. It was like God was reminding those women in the darkness of that tomb that his light was still in the world. There's a change from darkness to light. There's a change from fear to comfort. Look in verse 4 of the text. The Bible says, and for fear of him, for fear of the angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Notice he didn't tell the guards not to be afraid. They still needed to be afraid. <laughs> but to the women, he said, do not be afraid. I know you seek Jesus. We see a change from fear to comfort. We see a change from death to life. Notice what the angel said, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. And I love something at the end of verse six. I love that that word lay is past tense. Come, see the place where he used to lay. He used to be right here. He, in fact, just a few hours ago, he was right here. He's not here anymore because God has changed death into life. We see a change from death to life. We see a change from confusion to mission. The, the, the women had come out to the tomb with no purpose, confused about what even was going on. But now the Lord gave them a mission through the angel. Look in verse 7. The angel said, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. He says, I want you to go out with a mission to tell his disciples. And then from there, they told everyone they could, Jesus is alive. A change from confusion to mission, a change from despair to joyful worship. Look in verse eight. The Bible says the women departed quickly from the tomb. They were filled not only with fear because what they had seen was, was absolutely amazing to them. They didn't understand it. They were astonished. They were filled with fear, but also great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples, verse nine, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. Literally, he said, rejoice. His first words to those women was the word rejoice. He said, greetings, rejoice. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. They had gone out to the tomb in despair. They came back from the tomb worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Can I just remind you of something? Jesus changes everything. Man, when he comes into your life, he turns on the light of God's glory in your life. And he changes everything. I want to ask you, has he changed you? Look at what Jesus said in verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. He changed their hopelessness into hope. He changes everything. I read that in the year 2014, in a little village in India, there had not been electricity for over 33 years. They'd had no power. That means a whole generation grew up not even seeing the, the glow of one light bulb. They had never had electricity. Then in 2014, a humanitarian group came in and they installed solar power, so, solar panels and an electrical grid. And suddenly that little village had light and it changed everything. I mean, it just, it, it changed everything. Suddenly women could walk through that village at night and not be afraid of attack because there was light. Suddenly children could, could, could sit in their homes and, and open books and read them and learn how to read and study and, and learn things they had never learned before because there was light. 
Suddenly the hygiene and the cleanliness and the health, everything about that little village changed just because there was power and light. Can I tell you something? When Jesus comes into your life through his resurrection power, the change is even greater. He changes everything. Because he's not just a dead martyr that we remember. He is a living Savior who lives in us and changes us. He'll change your future. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, he wants to change your future. He wants to give you a future with him forever in heaven. That's what the Bible describes as eternal life. It's forever in heaven with God in a perfect place forever. He wants to change your future. He wants to change your perspective. He'll give you a new confidence for living each day here on earth when he comes into your life. He wants to give you a new hope. His light shines through his resurrection. Then there's a third thing we see, a third truth about the light of Jesus. Third, his light is a light sent out to the world. A light sent out to the world. Now look in verse 16 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28. The Bible says after Jesus rose from the dead that the the chief priests, the religious leaders, went to the Roman authorities and said, listen, if anybody asks you what happened to his body, just just tell people that his disciples came and stole the body from the tomb. That was a lie. But they shared that lie as far as they could share it. And yet Jesus just kept showing up. Over a period of about 40 days, he kept showing up and he presented himself alive with irrefutable proofs, the Bible says in in the book of Acts, that he was alive. And then after some time after his resurrection, the Bible says he took his 11 disciples along with other believers to a mountain in Galilee. Look in verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Can I stop right there? There are a whole big group of people in the presence of Jesus worshiping him, but even then some doubted. The same thing's true right here, right now. Lots of people worshiping Jesus. Lots of people enjoying the joy and the light of the resurrection because we know it's true. But even in this room, just like on that mountain, there are some who doubt. You wonder, can can Jesus really do something in your life? He can. You wonder, is Jesus really real? He is. Some worshiped him, some doubted, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I remind you of my point. His light is sent out to the world. He spoke to his disciples and other believers in that place. And he says, I'm sending you everywhere with this message. I want you to make disciples. A disciple is simply a follower of of Jesus, and you show you're a follower of Jesus by being baptized. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being baptized doesn't save you, but being baptized shows that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. And then a disciple also grows. He shows he's he's saved by being baptized, but he grows by obeying Jesus, teaching them all the things I've commanded you. And Jesus says, I'm with you until the end of the age. He's with us as we go in his name. I want to take just a moment in the name of Jesus to talk to you about following Jesus Christ in baptism and how important that is because it's a resurrection Easter truth. Baptism shows that we've died to our old life and come alive to a new life in Jesus Christ. The word baptize in in the Greek language was actually not a religious word. It was a word they just used to talk about putting something underwater. When a woman was washing her dishes and she put them down into the water, she, she said, I'm baptizing these dishes. 
Or if two little boys were out playing in a stream or in a pond or in a pool and one of them wanted to dunk the other, they didn't say, I'm going to dunk you. They said, I'm going to baptize you because the word baptize means to dip, to dunk, or to plunge. Now, I'll tell you, I'm glad to be called a Baptist and not a dipper, dunker, (laughs) or plunger. I'm glad not to be called those things. But that's what the word means. And, and, And this is an Easter truth. This is a resurrection truth. Baptism, being plunged under the water and then being being brought back up is a picture of dying to our old life and coming alive to a new life in Jesus. When I was baptized, it was a funeral service for the old Stephen Rummage. And there was only one mourner at that service. That was the devil. He hated to see the old me die because he wanted me to be with him. But everybody else who saw, my mom, my dad, my friends, people from my church, everybody else was there to celebrate because the old me was being buried and a new me was coming alive. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It means the old life is over, a new life has begun. That's why Jesus said, I want you to baptize people, command them to be baptized in the name of the Father, to show that God is their Father, in the name of the Son, to show that Jesus is their Savior, in the name of the Holy Spirit, to show that the Holy Spirit lives inside of them. I was in Israel a few years ago, and I was baptizing people in the Jordan River. Usually, we're there at the beginning of January. And, you know, there's an old spiritual song that says, the Jordan River is chilly and cold. I would like to bear personal testimony to that song. (laughs) It's some of the coldest water I've ever been in. But I'm there. I'm I'm wearing a white robe. I've got on hip waders because it's so cold. And and, and I'm there. And and some people from our group had, had been baptized that day in the Jordan River. And, by the way, being baptized in the Jordan River is no more spiritual than being baptized in this baptistry or anywhere else. But to know that we were in the place close by where Jesus was baptized was just a special thing. And so I was baptizing and finished baptizing all the people in our group who needed to be baptized. And I'm I'm coming up out of the Jordan River. And as I'm coming up out of the water, there are four men who come up to me. There are four Nigerian men. They're, They're usually large groups from Nigeria there in Israel because their nation will send them there on a pilgrimage. And so there's always large groups of Nigerians there. They sing so beautifully. They wear colorful clothes. It's incredible to see them. There were four Nigerian men. Two of them were wearing white robes. Two of them were just wearing street clothes. And the two guys in street clothes pointed to the other two guys and asked me, will you baptize these two brothers? I'm standing in the cold Jordan River. Will you baptize these two brothers? And I said, well, I need to hear their testimony. And so they began to share their testimony. I'm standing in the cold Jordan River. I said, don't start at the beginning of your life. Just tell me how you got saved. (laughs) And so they told me how they got saved. And after they told me how they got saved, I brought them out. Well, but before that, I asked the, the, the two guys who were in street clothes, I said, who are you? And we said, we are their pastors. And I said, then why don't you baptize them? They said, because you are already wet. (laughs) Why is baptism such a big deal that I would travel 6,500 miles from the United States to Israel to baptize those guys? And they would travel about 2,500 miles from Nigeria to Israel to be baptized. Why is it such a big deal? Because it's a resurrection picture. And it's not a resurrection picture that we created. It's a resurrection picture that Jesus commanded. Look again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Listen, on the day you were baptized, you said the old life and the old me is dead. And I have a new life because Jesus Christ has saved me. You went into the dark waters of baptism and you came up into the bright light of resurrection life through Jesus Christ. When he turns the light on in your life, 
life. It changes everything. His light was shrouded temporarily by the tomb. His light shines eternally through the resurrection. His light changes every heart who trusts in him. And I want to ask you today, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? And if you say, yes, I have, then I would ask you, are you obeying him and living for him? Because remember, baptism shows that you're a believer, but obedience grows you more and more into what Jesus wants you to be because he's turned the light on in your life, Christian. You can live your life day by day for him. <laughs>